So I think we'll begin. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist here at the Maxwell Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center. I help manage all of our programming here. Before we begin, please be aware that Mass General will be live streaming and recording this presentation for Mass General social media. Mass General staff are trained in patient safety and privacy. The staff will not interfere with the presentation in any way. If you're not comfortable asking a question out loud, feel free to write your question on the card, either raise your hand or place it in the basket, and I'd be happy to ask a question for you. So today we have Dr. Julia Jacobson. She is the medical director for the Continuum Project within the Division of Palliative Care and Geriatric Medicine at Mass Channel, and she is here to give a talk on coping and living well with serious illness. So please join me and welcome Dr. Jacobson. Wonderful. Thank you all for coming. Today we're going to be talking about a topic that is dear to my heart, which is how do you live well even in the face of serious illness? And I'm going to be showing you three video. There's also opportunity for questions. If you have questions, I'm happy to take them as we're talking. Often another person has the same question, and so it can make the discussion that we all have together a little bit more interesting. So feel free to, to raise your hand and interrupt. We're going to start with the story of Lillian Gonzalez, who faces illness with her mother. Her mother has dementia. And together, she and her family try and figure out what that means and, and how to live with that. So I'm going to have you watch this and think to yourself, what does it mean for them to live well? What are the ways in which they're trying to do that? My mom was a very phenomenal person, hardworking woman. She grew up in Puerto Rico. She came to the United States. Uh, and she ended up working in, you know, the sweatshops in New York. That's how she made a living. But she was a great seamstress. She looked so close for me. She would have matching mother and daughter clothes, which nowadays would be like, oh. My mom had uh, had cancer. It was, it was in 2014. And she came and stayed with me for a period of time. And we thought that the chemotherapy had actually affected her memory. It turned out that she actually had Alzheimer's. And so she ended up living with me for a period of time. I took care of her as best I could for several years, pretty much full time. And it ended up that we couldn't take care of her anymore due to safety concerns and safety issues. My mom had always explained to us about her desire. She really didn't want to go to a nursing home, which I can't blame her. I certainly wouldn't want that either, although the nursing home that she went to, they gave her wonderful care. And she had said that she wanted a certain quality of life. But I think it's really important to understand what quality of life means because it's very different for different people. And some can articulate very clearly what quality of life would mean to them, and some clearly can't. I do find that the more conversations there are with regards to each step of the process helps a little bit because then everybody feels like they're part of that process, there are some levels of control that they have. What I tried to do right from the beginning with my siblings is to engage them in whatever care she needed. So even though I had the healthcare proxy, I wanted them to be part of that decision making process. I think it, uh, for my younger brother, it was a little bit harder, and I just would talk with him and just listen as best I could, and then also bring him, bring him back to what would mom have wanted. I've had conversations with my kids about quality of life. They know how I live my life and how I live my life, and so that they understand this may be very difficult, but this is what I would like. The importance of the work that, that the coalition is doing, I think that the more involvement and the more training that medical, medical personnel have, the easier these transitions can be made for families. And I think that the more information gets out there, the more support that can be given to families, I think the process can be made a lot, a lot easier and less painful for, the, for those who are survivors. You could hear for just one second, maybe. Anyone notice anything about the way she talked about her story, about what it meant for them to live well? There was uh, the moment where she's talking about her mother first coming to live with her and kind of caring for her and then being together full time for that time. And then her mother prioritized quality of life. And 
And one of my favorite moments in this clip is actually her talking about the nursing home and how her mother would never would have wanted to go, but the place she went was very nice and safe. Safety was also a priority for them, and keeping her mom safe and well cared for in this was part of one of the things that was guiding them in their decision making. So we know that quality of life means lots of different things to different people. And most people don't want care that's going to significantly reduce their quality of life, which, which makes sense. The other thing we know is that earlier conversations between patients and family members, between family members themselves, can help to improve patients' experience with an illness, their way of living with the illness. This is the traditional model of care. It used to be that the focus would be on, on treating the illness for a long time. And then at the very, very end, when people were really towards the end of their illness, that's when the conversations would begin. And what we found was that that didn't work very well. And actually, patients and families report better quality of life when it's a more integrated model. When, in this case, palliative care, but sometimes even the generalist palliative care that you're receiving from your primary care doctor or the hospital medicine doctor or your cardiologist, all those conversations that you may have or that your loved one may have along the way help to improve quality of life. And it gets to this question of, of, of kind of thinking about the illness and having that be a reason even more to think about what's important and how do you live well. Because you know that it's there and sometimes that can focus the mind a little bit. Time is maybe a little bit shorter than you hoped and so you're even more focused on doing the things that you want to do. So it's nice to say that, and it sounds pretty good, but most people have trouble doing it. Actually having these conversations is hard. I have to say, I've been meaning to have a conversation with my dad, this is my job, and I feel like it's never quite the right time. Um, and so what we see is most people don't have a conversation with their clinicians, often even with their family members, about what their priorities are, what the, about the bigger picture. And one of the things I'd like to, you to take away from this talk today is a way of thinking about how people cope and maybe a way to approach these conversations that can be a little bit easier. And so to do that, we're gonna talk a little bit about this idea of prognostic awareness, what people's sense is of the future. Not necessarily like exactly how much time it is, it, it actually doesn't matter, just more of a sense of what's <laughs> gonna happen with their illness. And so we're gonna use, uh, this is an example patient, this is an actor. And he's going to play a patient, John, who has metastatic lung cancer. He's a single father. And he has this cancer, but the oncologist feels like he's got a few years. Time isn't, isn't so short. Things aren't so imminent. And you're going to see me talking with John. And what I want you to be thinking about is if, if John or your brother or your son or your husband, would you be worried about denial? Would you be worried about having a conversation or thinking about how best to have a conversation with John? So I'm going to have Amy um, show you this video. Can you tell me or talk a little bit about how your life has changed since this diagnosis? Sure. Um, well, I guess I take better care of myself now. Sure. I'm more conscious about what I put into my body. And, um, I've learned a lot, you know, I've learned a lot about, about chemo and cancer and radiation and things like that. And I, I think of it like, I think of it like the cancer is a chronic disease, you know, mm -hmm. and the chemo is targeting, the, you know, the chemo that I'm taking right now yeah. is, is targeting the mutation. And if you mutates again, then they change the chemo. Right. That's kind of how I think about it, you know what I mean? And I probably just never really understood things like that before. But it's made me more aware. You know, I just I'm trying to like anybody else would, I'm trying to heal myself, right? So you're, you're, it sounds like you're thinking more about the, the cancer and how that's working, and also about how you can take care of yourself in this process. Yeah, yeah both, How you take care of your body. I mean, you know, I want to have a long, long time. Yeah, of course, you know, of course. So, yeah. How's your family doing with all this? Oh, you know, families, they're going to be like, cancer, it's the end, and, you know, and I, I told them, I said, you know, Getting the best treatment, I'm doing the best I can, and you know, enough. I, uh, I talk to a lawyer, you know, and try to get everything straightened out, get all my ducks in a row, you know, just in, just in case. And thinking about the future and making plans. Yeah, hands. you know, I mean, just in case, you know.
sometimes it's it's tough a little bit to think about sometimes. Hey, hey, you know what? Next year, I am going with a group of guys. I'm going to go snowboarding for the first time. Oh yeah. Ever. Yeah. All my friends they go all the time, and I'm, I've been really hold up. Right? <laughs> Be careful. That's dangerous. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I said I'm going to go. I promise I'm going to go in January, so it's going to be really. Oh, cool. that's that's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Sounds yeah. like it'll be nice to be with everybody. And yeah, it's great. New. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a group of childhood friends. We all grew up together, and we still a little bit of touch. You know, oh, so right. it's kind of cool. Right. Did they contact you because of the cancer, or was this something separate? Um, we always stayed in touch, but I think that everybody seems to be more more in touch lately because of that. Yeah. I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. I'm going to be around for 20 years, you know. But I think everyone's a little, a little nervous for me. That's what it takes, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so gonna have you vote. And the question is, is this denial yes or no? And you can just, just pick one. Um, people who are kind of worried a little bit, if this was your loved one, that they might be in a little denial, that it might be hard to have a conversation. Yeah. Anyone, anyone feel more comfortable? Like, nah, I'm not so worried. Okay, all right, so people who are worried, what did you see? What did what did he do? What were the things that he said? Yes. Um, only because I'm experiencing that in my life. Yeah. He changed the subject. Talked about snowboarding. Yes. So he clearly wanted to talk about that, where the cancer was much more obvious. But he changed the subject. So there is a sense that it was too intense. It was too much. And he gives you this cue, it's too much, I'm gonna to go to this completely separate place. Yes. And that feels like a cue that you can't really talk about it. Right, yes. And, and in my life, I try to bring the conversation back. Yeah. Yes. So we're gonna talk more about this. Um, what did other people see? There were lots of things. He tried to make a joke in light of it. Yes, yes. Um, so it feels like maybe keeping you a little bit away with humor and not taking it as, as seriously if you were the loved one trying to talk about it more. Um, absolutely. Other things people said, yes, yeah, saw, yes. He kept saying just in case when that doesn't define anything. I, I love that moment. It's like he's not being serious enough, right? You're like, not just in case. We're going to need this. And yet you're saying it as if it's kind of optional, right? Yes. Anyone else? 20 years. The 20 years, I know. I always, you know, I show this to clinicians. I do a lot of training with clinicians, and it's very important for clinicians to understand how patients cope with serious illness. And if you were somebody, clinician or family member, and somebody says that, it's really hard to know, like, oh gosh, how do we begin from, from there? That seems so off from at least what we were told about him. People who saw something else, what did you see? Yes, you saw something else. Um, it didn't really seem like denial. Okay. To be honest, it seemed yeah. more hopeful, and then his language was, because at the same time, you're, you weren't a family member, so I think if this was a family member he was talking to, it would be a completely different conversation, especially if, like, for example, I was his daughter, it would be, probably be like, oh, just in case, and he just, he did say he was getting his ducks in a row. He says so he's I'm, getting his I'm ducks in his row. Yep. Sure. I mean, it's okay for them to have hope. You don't want them to walk around with yet yeah, despair on their mind. Well, so that's one of the questions, right? How do we balance all of these things? Yeah. Yes. Other moments of realism that people saw. Yes. I, I thought, <clears throat> I agree with her, that because he did go to a lawyer, that he had been thinking about it, that he wasn't really in denial or, or you know, making some, but. But that he did, um, but the going snowboarding was, I thought, very positive and, and not like change, you know, he did change it because we do do that, especially with, with strangers or we change the subject, we don't want to stay on it. Well, the snowboarding moment is interesting because in some ways if you think, don't you understand how dangerous that is with all the cancer in your body? And on the other hand, you're like, Maybe it's a bucket list. Maybe he understands kind of and is trying to do these things that he always wanted to do. And so this, these same moments can have different meaning to different people. I show this to you guys, I show this to clinicians because we're often trying to think about how to talk about important things and we're getting these mixed cues from our loved ones. Um, sometimes we even notice them in ourselves 
of times when we're more realistic and can think about the harder times and times when we're more hopeful or really, really optimistic that we have both of those moments. What I think happens to many of us is that we are kind of enculturated with Kubler-Ross. People, are they familiar with her? She had the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And there's a sense with that that there's a process, that you're going through it. Denial is early, acceptance is the end, and somehow we're all working towards that. And I think when we're with patients who are facing serious illness, that's somewhere in the back of our heads. And I'm going to show you a different model that we use now here at Mass General that I think is a much more helpful model. It was actually developed by a psychiatrist here. He just turned 100 um, not so many years ago, Avery Weissman. But he had this idea that it's not so much a, a progression, that really what people are doing is they're swinging back and forth. And you have more hopeful times, and they can be wildly hopeful times. It doesn't actually matter. It's just a break, right? It's a time when you don't have to think about things so seriously. You can kind of live your life a little bit more, be engaged. And then there's more worry times. And we have those times, too, where we're either thinking about things, we're planning. He was planning to see his lawyer, presumably, to kind of take care of Will and other documents. Worry times are also times when we might feel a little bit sad. And actually that moment where he talks about snowboarding and he kind of changes the topic, he looks a little bit sad right before he makes that switch. And so those are the worry times when we're processing some of the grief of the loss of living with a serious illness. But that it's actually normal to go back and forth. It's normal and healthy, and we don't have to worry when someone expresses even wild, wild hopes for the future. As long as they're also having a moment or two when they can think about the illness um, and bake some realistic plans. We encourage people to live in the hopeful part. That's part of living well, of being hopeful, of being future oriented. And that we kind of embrace the swinging as normal and healthy and not something to worry about. And it's also not a sign that you have to put off conversations that you feel are important to have. Just because someone's swinging back and forth doesn't mean they also can't tolerate a conversation about, about the, kind of the future with you. So living well is going back and forth and kind of modulating the experiences of living with a serious illness. We also know that patients who live well, who report a higher quality of life, and we have these available, so you don't need to, um, I see people straining in the back to read it, but we can, we can give these, you these handouts. These are pictures <laughs> and handouts of other ways that we cope and that it's helpful to cope when you're facing a serious illness. And some of these are a way to kind of move back and forth between the harder times and the easier times. This lady here noticed, he, like, he started talking about snowboarding. That's a way of distracting yourself, right? You thought about it for a little while, it was hard, it was overwhelming, and then you distract yourself and you think about something else. That's okay, you're just practicing having those harder thoughts. And it's okay to take a break and engage in things that you care about. Problem solving is another way of kind of focusing and preparing for the future. That can sometimes be less emotional because you can kind of list all the different steps, make an organizational plan. And so sometimes that's a way of engaging the future that doesn't have to be as emotionally heavy as some of these other ways. Seeking social support is a useful way to be engaged with people. Sometimes social support is what helps people swing to the worried side. Maybe it's too hard to do by yourself but maybe when your family sits you down and everybody's there, you can kind of take a few more minutes of being in that harder place because you have the people who love you around you. Sometimes simply being engaged with your body and in relaxation can help that back and forth experience and kind of finding a way to relax into some of those harder moments. We'll include this if, if people want to have this. It's just a we work with patients and families and over time we've collected these ways that people have found to kind of manage that back and forth feeling and feel stronger with all of this. The other thing we see when we look at patients who are reporting better quality of life, who feel like they're living okay or even well with an illness, is they tend to lean in a little bit. They tend to engage with the problem rather than always avoiding, always avoiding, always avoiding. And so if you can figure out, even in very, very small ways, 
people f often feel like they have more agency and more control if they can begin to do some of that engaged coping. We see that they have better positive expectations for the future and they're actually more hopeful. It's kind of paradoxical. You know, you're, at, you're doing more planning, you're thinking about the hard stuff, but it makes people feel more hopeful because it's not the elephant in the room, right? It's not the thing we can never talk about ever. It becomes something that is a part of living and that actually helps people feel hopeful. One way to do that is with problem solving skills. And so this is a, an approach that's taught to patients and families in some cancer centers and it's just a way of reminding people of the things they already knew, but sometimes when you're stressed and you're facing a serious illness, it's easy to forget. And so reminding people of how to approach problems, approaching them with some creativity. I always know when I'm like facing a hard time and I can think of only one solution, I know I'm in a bad spot, right? I know I need to kind of take a step back, I need to regroup, because there's gotta be more than one solution. You don't wanna kind of lock down. And so this idea that you approach harder problems with some sense of, of creativity and ease and looking for all the possible solutions and also some optimism. You know, optimism doesn't get enough credit. We're always so worried about people being hopeful and in denial. We don't realize how helpful that can be as a way to manage a hard time. And we should really give, the cre give it the credits it's due that you, people can get through this. Planning is a helpful way to really put in mind and kind of in place some of these ideas and then this is actually my favorite, seeking experts. People underestimate how important it is when you get stuck to be able to call on someone else. And so knowing that even within this cancer center, within this hospital, there are so many experts that are willing to help and, and really have the expertise in this domain to guide patients and families through illness and feeling empowered to call a palliative care consult, ask for a social worker, ask for help if you feel like you're stuck and struggling. So I, I'm encouraging you to engage as a way to live well. So I'm, I know that it's paradoxical, but I want to show you a video, one very concrete planning way to begin engagement is to think about who's gonna be my healthcare agent? Who's gonna be my proxy? Who's gonna be my, my loved one's person that helps to make decisions? It's a very simple first step. And I'm gonna show you this lovely um, video of how to think about picking somebody who might be your agent. Uh oh, did Amy leave? <laughs> I think she's, um, it's, it's um, on the internet, and it's probably, that's it. No, step one. I said we have to switch screens somehow. Step one, choose a medical decision maker. We just um, couldn't switch it. Which other one? This is it. Perfect. Why choose a medical decision maker? Because of accidents or illness, three out of four people will be unable to make some or all of their own medical decisions at some time in their life. If this happens, doctors need to know who can make decisions for you. A medical decision maker is someone who can make medical decisions for you only if you are too sick to make your own decisions. But you can ask this person to start making decisions for you whenever you want, even now. Choose a medical decision maker ahead of time. This video shows an example of a serious medical situation. Your situation may be different. Mrs. Jones, your husband is very sick. He has a serious lung infection and he's not breathing well right now. So we're going to need to move him to the intensive care unit. Intensive care unit? He's very sick. And because he's not able to talk right now, you are his legal decision maker. He never told me what he wanted. We never discussed this. 
one month later. I'm glad you're feeling better, Mr. Jones. Your time in the hospital was difficult on all of us. Especially me. As doctors, we want to be sure to follow our patients' wishes. But if they're not able to tell us themselves, then we need to be able to talk to someone who really understands what they want and can share it. I was so upset that day, I just couldn't think. That's why it's so important to discuss your wishes beforehand and to ask someone to be your medical decision maker. James is a pretty independent person. I never make decisions for him. I just didn't know what he would want. You know, I always assumed my wife would just know what I wanted and she would make the right decisions. I wish we had talked about it. I mean, now that James has asked me to be his medical decision maker and we've started to talk about what's important to him, I feel so much better, more prepared. I know what James wants and I know that I have his permission to make decisions for him. I feel better too, for her and for me. Choose a medical decision maker. A medical decision maker can be a family member or friend, or group of people with one person who will speak to the doctors for the group. If you are unable to make your own decisions, your decision maker may need to talk to your doctors and say yes or no to medical treatments for you, or decide where you get medical care, such as a nursing home or hospital. A good medical decision maker is a family member or friend who is 18 years of age or older can talk to you about your wishes, can be there for you when you need them. You trust to follow your wishes and do what is best for you. You trust to know your medical information and is not afraid to ask doctors questions and speak up about your wishes. It is okay if you are not ready to choose a medical decision maker. It is also okay if you do not know anyone right now who could play that role. Many people tell me they don't have friends or family who could make medical decisions for them. This is okay. I see it all the time. But whether you have a medical decision maker or not, using PREPARE can really help make sure you get the care that you want. Going through the PREPARE program and watching the videos can still help you identify what is most important to you and can help you work with your medical team to make sure you get the care that you want. See who these people chose as their decision maker. Cynthia chose her husband. My husband and I have been married for over 40 years and we know each other really well. I can talk to him about my medical wishes and I know he'll respect them even if they're different from his. Ken is not ready to choose. I'm kind of a loner. I have been all my life. So I don't have any friends or family that I trust to make medical decisions for me. I guess this could change, but for now I think I'll focus more on deciding what matters most in my life and thinking about my medical wishes so I can share them with my doctors. I'll come back and choose a medical decision maker if it seems right for me in the future. Jorge chose his family. We have a very big family and we always make decisions together. I couldn't ask just one person, so I asked my sister and my nieces to work together to make decisions for me as a group. But my family doesn't always agree. Because my niece Vera lives the closest to me and knows me best, I asked her to be the spokesperson. Helen may choose her neighbor. My husband died many years ago. We never had kids, and I don't have any family left. I could <coughs> ask to be a medical decision maker. But my neighbor knows me very well. We keep an eye out for each other. Maybe I could ask her. John chose his son to make all his decisions. My oldest son will make all of my medical decisions if I become very sick. It will be his job to talk to the doctors. Can you think of any family or friends who may be able to make medical decisions for you if you become? I'm gonna stop there. 
what I really like about this um, video is it just shows the different ways that people can choose a decision maker, that it's not one size fits all, that this process um, is different for different people. I always say when I'm talking with patients that one of our jobs together is to figure out who that medical decision maker is gonna be. The second job is to actually have conversations about what matters and what's important. Um, and so we're gonna just change gears just a little bit to think about that component of living well. And we know that patients often don't have these conversations. The other thing that you should know is that clinicians often don't have these conversations. <laughs> Fewer than a third of us will initiate these conversations with our patients. They're hard conversations. We often do it late when people are in the hospital, and sometimes they're really limited and brief. And what we know is clinicians aren't always well trained to be able to engage with patients and families about <coughs> living well and preparing, doing both of those things. And at Mass General, we have an initiative to try and help that, to try and help our clinicians do this more and to do it better. And so these are the, the purple circles are the usual conversations. This is usually when we start having conversations when people are, are pretty sick. This is a, a graph of time, this is a graph of function, and as people become more ill, they are less able to do the things that they want to do, and this is often what gets everybody started talking about what's happening. What we're trying to do is have these conversations earlier when people are feeling well so that they can use the information to then prioritize how they want to live. These aren't conversations about very end of life. They're about what matters most, what's important, and how do you want to live given that we're facing this serious illness. So we try to encourage clinicians to have this well, and we've actually had to do a lot of teaching so that clinicians know how to approach these conversations. This is a workshop we run. These are primary care clinicians. This includes physicians, care managers, nurse practitioners, all of us working together with a patient actor. You might recognize him from the other video. Um, he's got the same shirt on, actually. But um, So this is a group of people working together to think about how we can do this better. How can we have better conversations with patients and families? And you might even have a clinician that uses a script. What we found is that when we give clinicians a format to follow, these conversations are often more effective it's easier for clinicians to begin, and they're actually higher quality conversations. And this work comes out of Ariadne Labs, which is a Tulva Wande's lab. And he you know, did a lot of his early work in the surgical space. And it was kind of chaos, and he was like, hey guys, if we have a checklist like they do in aviation, we might be a little bit more organized, we might have fewer errors. And so he took that approach, and he used it in my field in communication to say, hey guys, if we have a sequence and in order to having these tough conversations everyone's avoiding, we might be able to have more of them, we might be able to have them earlier, and they may be better quality. So this is the checklist approach to communication. When we train clinicians, we actually train them, and you can see it in this video, we train them to hold the checklist in their hands as they're having <coughs> a conversation. There's no shame in referring to a guide to be able to ask patients and families important questions. So this is a new approach that we're using throughout Mass General. And we've had, we've trained about 1,200 clinicians. We don't think this is just doctor work. We're training nurse practitioners, we're training social workers, our nurses on the floors are tremendously involved. They're often the people that are at patients' bedsides hour in and hour out, thinking about the what ifs, thinking about people's worries, also asking about their hopes. And so we've trained all of the team to be able to engage with patients and families around this. And we're seeing that actually, this is just 2019 data, lots of people are having more than one conversation. Because this isn't a one conversation, what do you want? It's actually a process over time that's about what do you know, what's important, what are you hoping for, what are you worried about, how do we support you in living with this tough thing, and how do you live well with it, despite it. So we're seeing people have more than one conversation. 
And we're, we figured out a way to put this in the medical record that actually enables clinicians to build on each other's work. It shouldn't be that you have one conversation with somebody and then two weeks later have the same conversation with somebody else. What we want is for you to have that conversation with your PCP and then if you get admitted or if your loved one gets admitted, someone's able to see what was said and understand that conversation and then check in with you. Hey, things are, we're in a different place. How are you doing? What are you hoping for now? What's important now? And so that it's not a chaos of conversation, but actually an organized progression through the hospital. And so this allows us, this is actually from Epic, it's what clinicians see, to track these conversations. This is four conversations. This is from a patient. You can see it's anonymized. They began in 2017, and it finished in um, November of 2018. And she has four different conversations over time with her different people on her medical team, thinking about the future and planning. Um, and you can see right here, what's important is visible so that clinicians can also know what's important and what matters to people. Any questions at all? This says the, um, as open notes becomes more dispersed through the hospital, you will also be able to see these conversations. And we're transparent about this process that we're all engaged together in. So if this is something that you also want to do, if you're also finding that it would be helpful for you to talk with a clinician about what matters most about the big picture, these are just two ways to begin such a conversation. You might say, would it be possible to, for us to find a time to talk about the big picture? Or you could say, I wonder if we could begin a serious illness conversation. That's what we started calling this. So, this is a two-way process where clinicians may approach patients and families, and patients and families may also find that they need more information or they're at a place where they want to reprioritize. As you're thinking about having a conversation, these are some questions that patients and families have. You may have others, but some people want to know about thinking about what the illness would be like. They sometimes people want to know time frame. <coughs> what might happen to them physically, what comfort care means, how hospice can help. People may be wanting to talk about their worries, thinking about the care that they may or may not want. So all of these are variations of thinking about the future. And the way we think about this is that these conversations about your goals and values are the shared part of shared decision making that this is what you're expert in, your patient and family's values. And your clinician is expert in the medical options and the prognosis and the details of medical care. And together this information is synthesized into a recommendation and a plan. That it's really both together that is the way that we kind of move forward to, um, to live with the illness. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there. Do people have questions? Yes. So this is really kind of outside of what you cover. I'm a parent of a kid with a really serious illness. And yes. um, I'm boring the hell out of my friends. And uh, so I, I was just uh, wondering if you had some tips about how to cope with the feeling of solitude because yeah. of course it's an unusual position in a way to be in in society. Uh, you know, what, what ways to relate, to not relate, how do we know when our friends are trying not to roll their eyes at us and you know, that kind of. Yes, yes. Um, I actually have a good friend in a similar situation. Um, I think finding that community is essential. And you, we get, you and I can talk afterwards about resources to help you find that. Um, because I think you're right, there's something about being able to share and understand and kind of empathize with that situation that not everybody can do. And it's a unique situation. And then one of the challenges with taking care of a child who has a serious illness is sometimes um, you're in that position for a long period of time. And so how does, what does that mean? And what does that mean um, for the rest of your life and enjoying the rest of your life? And um, having something that's hard. 
And so, yes, I think that that's a specific challenge um, and that finding community in that is very important. So yeah, we'll find it. Just how can we look at that? Other people have challenges. Double denial. Double denial. Denial. Tell me more. I think I know denial what you mean. from patient, and then you have denial from the family. So nobody wants to face what's coming. So everyone's swinging on their own pendulum. Patients are swinging on their pendulums. Family members are swinging. Sometimes clinicians. Um, you know, we love our patients, and we get hopeful too. And sometimes we don't want to see what's happening. And so there's this way that we all need to find each other in this. I would say the thing that we've been learning over the years is that um, in some ways it's like holding a hot potato. It, it, sometimes just a little conversation, a little way that you talk about it and then you stop uh, is a way to, to be given. Because otherwise everyone's in kind of denial, 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 everyone's kind of colluding, everyone's being hopeful, and then you never really can talk about the hard things. One of the things that we teach clinicians, which I think is actually helpful, is we say these conversations are like a box. And you get to open the box and you can talk about that, but then you can also close the box. And me as a clinician, I might say, hey, I think it's time to close the box. You as a patient or family member might say, I think we've had enough for today, let's close that box. And it's a metaphor for containment and it gives you some control. When these conversations are so hard to begin, you can be like, we can just crack that box a little bit and then we can decide to close it again. So the box may be a way to begin if you're struggling or if your loved one is struggling. Sometimes I say to patients, you know, we open the box and we close it and we like really opened it. And then I'm like, next time the box is in the corner, the whole visit, we're not even gonna touch that box, right? Because you need a break. Um, but you also need to be able to have some control. Other comments <coughs> or questions? Yes. So um, it's sort of like piggybacking off of what she said that my partner, he does not want anyone to know about his illness. His family, my family, so with due respect for him, I haven't said it. So it's isolating for you to not be able to talk about it. And you're in this tough spot where you're trying to respect him and his wishes and his privacy. And so how do you navigate that together? Yes, yes. And who are the people on the team who can help? Sometimes a PCP can be someone who you talk with, that's your doctor, but is a place who, where they have some medical expertise and can understand the situation, but it's also a place that can be private. And that way you can think together about what you need in the situation. Other resources that are available for patients and families are most disease centers have a social worker. And so sometimes that social worker can see the patient and sometimes that social worker may work with a family member because we know that everyone has different communication needs and different ways that they need to be supported in this. Another resource for some patients and families is a palliative care consult. We can be another place that it's kind of like we are the box where you start to begin having these conversations and start to begin naming the tensions of how do we kind of keep this private and also make sure we have enough support in all of this, right? And sometimes even just naming that tension is a way of loosening it a little bit. So those are some resources that are here. And I'm also happy to talk after. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? I'm happy to talk afterwards. I'll, I'll stay around a little bit. Uh, thank you. Oh, yes. oh, yeah. I would say I'd love to get a copy of it. A copy of like um, of the, of the, the checking. Yeah. Resource. Do you guys? Uh, is there also an, uh, a way to get the checklist? Or is that just for MGH that you guys use? It's yeah. Do you have a checklist that you we, guys? Use? It's interesting. We have we have two patient facing brochures. One is about those questions I had um, in the last slides about kind of yeah. preparing if you want to have a conversation. Ways to think about questions you might ask. 
The other is about coping and kind of how do you fortify your coping skills in this tough time. And so it kind of it will list that. So you're welcome to both of those. Certainly the um, checklist is available. We may be able to just email and give it to you. It's, uh, it's, I'm to put a plug in for Ariadne Labs, which I um, like so much how they've managed this program. It's all open source. So they created this document that then can be in the world. No one's profiting from it. Every institution can take it and change it and modify it and make it their own. So all these materials that I'm sharing originated in Ariadne Labs, and then we, we wanted to make it a little different, so we did that, but we just acknowledged them at the bottom. So there's nothing proprietary about it. Uh -huh. I'm just trying to think of the best way to get it, give it to, to you so okay. that you can have it. So you can, you can find me afterwards and we can okay. figure that out. But anyone else who wants to see that, it's absolutely available and just positive things in the world. Yeah. Yes? Is there a checklist that my son is my proxy? Yes. And, um, but he's very quiet. And he goes, you know, when I go to the doctor, I'm like, you know, questions. And, yes. But, but he's, you know, and I don't know if, if when the time comes that he will, um, he'll be able to um, ask the right questions, even though we've talked about things. Yeah. Um, is there something that he's like, you know, you have the clinician checklist. Is there a checklist that, or any proxy that can bring with them? So the, so the Five Wishes is an interesting document. I don't know if you've heard about that. It's, it's, it's very specific priorities for, for very end of life, so it's quite concrete. And so you can spell out a fair amount of specific detail. One of the challenges that we all face in thinking about um, just chronic illness and managing chronic illness is that technology is evolving so much. And we don't actually know what the decisions are that will face us or that, that will face our families. And there's a lot of medical complexity in that. And so what we've learned over the years is it's not that helpful for people to sit down and say, dialysis, yes, IV fluids, no. Like kind of really specifying that doesn't help because you might need emergent dialysis and it might help you get through a bump in the road and then you have another six months. And so we don't want to make too many decisions early. It's really about A, having open communication and B, just having a general sense of what your priorities are, that I want to be comfortable, I want to have a quality of life. More abstract priorities are actually more helpful for, in, for, for decision makers. Um, than the very, very granular detail. So we're all trying to figure this out together because, and the crazy thing is people's priorities change, right? So as, as, one, as we all become sicker, what we want is different. And so how do we then figure that out as a community? Yeah. And take the emotional part out. So people are just emotionally stuck and can't make decisions. Well, as I say, you can never take the emotional part out, right? It's like, it's this big, big part of all of this. But how do you manage, manage the emotions so that you can make decisions? Or how do you give your loved ones clear enough guidance so that they can feel the freedom to make decisions? And actually, one of the most important priorities when you choose a medical decision maker is actually granting flexibility. Because we don't know what will happen. And the most important thing you can say is, look, who knows what's going to happen, but I trust you, and I give you flexibility to make the best decision that you can in the situation. I know you're going to do a good job, and you just kind of leave it there, because you just can't foresee all of the decisions that people are going to make, and the last thing you want to do is burden your medical decision maker, the person that you care very much about in the world, and so you want to figure out a way to kind of help them through it, it, it gently. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. These are wonderful questions, and I'll stay around afterwards if people have more.